Good afternoon. Welcome to lecture number one of Economics and Society. Today we are going to talk about basics and prerequisites. It's going to be a basic lecture, quite easy for everybody to follow. I will try to go at a normal pace so you will guys be able to follow me. In case you think I'm going too slow, there is a solution for that. YouTube has a, a little gear down there in the corner. You can press the gear and then you can select speed of the lecture. You can select 1.5 or two times uh, the speed of the normal lecture, and then it will go fast in points that you think that uh, I'm blathering or uh, there are things that you, you understand very easily and you don't need to dedicate time. So this will save you a lot of time. So I would like to welcome you to the course, Economics and Society. Uh, as we said in the streaming session, this is going to be a course that my target is that it will be quite useful to you. So I want to give you a basic presentation and the basic knowledge today of what we need to know. So let's get started, not to lose time. Today's lecture will be, as I said, easy, and it will also be quite short because I already stole some of your time with a live streaming that, that lasted for quite some time. And then we will go for something like half a lecture today. And also, as I said, easy for everybody to follow. So let's get started. So we are going to talk about what is economics, what are the basic concepts of economics, and we will have a very brief discussion about graphs and equations, and I will show you a tutorial video that you can actually follow about that particular third segment. So let's start with the question, what is economics. Before we, we get started, I have to tell you that economics is a notion that is very uh, usual for people to misunderstand it. They, they don't really understand what economics is. And uh, the basic understanding should come very early, but I have to tell you that economics as a science is a very fluid science. And uh, I have met people that they are very advanced students, especially very advanced in economics, third year, fourth year, and they, they quite not really get what exactly economics is about. They have a wrong impression. So it's very important to start from the beginning and say what economics is, and more importantly, what economics is not. So, uh, as uh, every time we should start from a definition, where does the word economics come from? So let's, start, let's try to find the roots of the word uh, economics. So economics comes from the Greek word economica. Actually, uh, in, in modern Greek, we call it economiki epistemi, the science of economics. Economica, which is the ancient word, is a word that comes from two other words, ikos, and nomi, economica, ikos and nomi. Ikos means house, home, the, the home of the, of the family, the household. And then nomi means laws. So it's the science that examines the laws of the households. In other words, how households make decisions. Keep that down in your notes. This will be extremely important, making decisions is the cornerstone of economics, and we will talk about it more a little later. So economics, as a modern definition, we can say that is a science, uh, the study of how individuals and societies choose to use the scarce resources. So resources that they are given to them from previous generations, or they just uh, discovered uh, out there in the nature. Now, in this definition, you have to really be able to observe what is going on behind the words. So the most important words here is the word choose. The word choose is, as I said before, what is behind making decision, making choices. And we also have another key word, which is the word scarce. So how to make decisions under scarcity. How to make decisions under scarcity is actually meaning in our modern society how to make decisions, period, because everything is scarce. There is scarcity of money, there is scarcity of resources, there is scarcity of time, there is scarcity of, uh, of, of actual suitable resources in order to do something. So there is scarcity in almost everything. Almost nothing 
is in abundance, and therefore our decisions are always constrained under scarcity. So, uh, economics is much beyond the science, it's a way of thinking, because when you learn how to make decisions, this has to do with a way of thinking. You don't make only decisions regarding what you are going to do with your money or how you are going to run your business. You make decisions about everything in your life. Every, uh, every important node of your life is what? It's actually a decision. What should I do? Should I go get a job or should I continue my studies? Should I, uh, should I uh, open a store or should I work in an office? Should I marry with Maria or should I marry with Sophia? So these are two different uh, choices that you have under some particular scarcity situation that you have to pick from the alternatives that you have, two, three, infinite alternatives in some case, you have to pick only one because that's, uh, that's what you, you have the ability in order to do. That's the, the one that you actually can afford to, to continue on. So let's consider a non-economic example of societal choice. Okay, a non-economic example. And I have this example here, I have it uh, for years, because the Western versus the Soviet educational system for, med for medical doctors. I tried really hard. It was extremely difficult to find a more boring example than that. Uh, it's an example that uh, in the beginning when I, ask, when I teach this class uh, to students face to face, I ask them to try to find, are there economics? Can there possibly be? economics between how each system, the Soviet system, which was a totally communist system, and the Western system, which is a capitalist system, the choice that they make in order to train doctors. Can it be a decision that is an economical decision? And this is uh, the, the experiment that we try to follow in our discussion in class. But uh, this is an example that is not fun if I just teach it all to the camera. So what I want to do, I want to uh, go on another example and try to show you that economics is actually everywhere. Economics is not in how you, you deal with your business, how to deal with your finances, how to keep books, how to uh, uh, decide which stocks you're going to buy, and all this fancy stuff that you will see in the movies. Economics is everywhere. Economics has to do with all societal decisions and all societal problems that a society or uh, a democracy might have. So uh, it's uh, today, August, 12th of August of uh, 2020, and uh, number one topic in the news, as probably it's going to be whenever you watch uh, this lecture. I don't know for how long we are going to go online. So the, the top topic in the news is the COVID-19 situation. What happens with the COVID-19 situation? And if you uh, go a little back to the news, you are going to discover that uh, starting in February and March and a little bit till the beginning of April, the entire discussion that was on TV, that was on the newspapers, that was on, on uh, social media, was about the medical aspects of the disease. Okay, now nine out of ten discussions they were about uh, they were about medically what is happening with this uh, particular disease, and then the other one out of 10 was uh, memes about the disease because that's, that's every time the case. Fast forward to August and even from before, but let's start in August because you can just uh, open the news, uh, CNA or the Straits Times or even CNN or uh, BBC on another tab in your computer and you can see that first three topics will be on the coronavirus and all three of them, they are not going to be on the medical aspects of the disease. They're going to be about the jobs that are lost, about the economy that is staying behind. In a recent uh, research here in Singapore, uh, economists actually concluded that in these six first months, we have lost all the gains that we had from economic growth for the last three years, just in six months with the disease. 
And you can see it around you. You don't even need to go to the news to see that the economics of the disease was much harsher, harsher to our society than the, uh, the, the medical problem. We had uh, several dead people, and this is uh, something, something horrible, but we also have the lives and the livelihood of millions, literally millions, to be under this new situation. So uh, you see that, for example, you cannot be here. You cannot be around me. You cannot actually discuss with me. You can, we cannot have this class in the, in the way that we intended to have it. So you are a victim for that. Your, your education, we try our best to try to keep it up, but no matter what, you cannot compare being next to your professor when I uh, gives the lecture and you can stop me and you can ask me questions or I can see in your eyes if you are getting bored so I can go faster or if you are falling behind so I can go slower. So these are the little costs that we're taking and also the costs of our relatives that they are losing their jobs, other people that they have to leave Singapore because they, they, uh, they, they lost their jobs, they lost their positions that they had, they lost the contracts, and now they have to go back to the countries. Uh, people that they got stuck in the airports and they, they cannot go back to the country, and even people that they face hunger, people that they face unemployment, people that they had to close their stores. These are life stories that they come out of the disease and have nothing to do with the disease. In some places that they had the devastating consequences of the disease, the disease didn't even appear to more than, than uh, 500, 600, 700 people per million of, of the citizens that they were there. So we see that the economic consequences of the disease are much harsher and much more intense than the medical consequences of the disease. And this is something that we have to consider. This is something that we should be able to understand. It doesn't matter if after you finish SMU, you are going to become a lawyer or a psychologist or a financier. Knowing economics, no matter where you're going, where your destination is, it is going to help you to understand the world around you a little better. So this is what economics is. Economics is how the society is going to make decisions, how the society is going to be that the lives of my seniors are more important than these millions of people losing their jobs. And how you can actually put the the pluses and the minuses, the pros and the cons of every decision in a cost-benefit analysis and understand what you should do. Because here is also scarcity. You cannot do both. You cannot have both your seniors to be okay and the immunocompromised and also at the same time have your businesses working at full blast. So you have to select one or the other. So there are different opinions, but, but no matter what, you... If you know economics, you will be able to have this process of thinking that will allow you to make these decisions for yourself and to have an opinion for yourself that is educated. So as I'm going to repeat several times, in this course, we are going to talk a lot of times about your opinions. I have no intention whatsoever to change anybody's opinion. The only thing that I want you to do with the knowledge that we give you is to use this knowledge in order to have educated opinions, to be able to argue about your opinion. Somebody can say, I believe A, and here is my justification, and somebody else can say, uh, I believe B, and here is my other justification. And then once you can justify, you're in a position to justify your opinion based on science, you are okay. It doesn't matter what is your opinion. It matters if you are able to justify this opinion. So let's now examine the branches of economics. Let's see what are the main branches of the science. We have microeconomics, which examines the behavior of individual decision-making units. It deals with the decision by the uh, by the units of the economy. A unit can be a firm, can be an, a household, can be a market regulator, can be an entire market. All these are 
units in terms of how economics examines it. Then we have macroeconomics. It examines the behavior of economic aggregates. So it deals with uh, variables like the income of the entire economy, the production in the entire economy. Be careful, not in an industry, in an entire economy. Employment variables, again, in the economy. Everything on a national scale. And then we have another branch, which uh, recently separated from the other branches, relatively recently, the last uh, 40 years, let's say. And it's called econometrics. This is uh, uh, the way that we analyze the numbers that we have in economics. It uses mathematics and statistics to estimate the micro and the macro variable. So it's uh, a method of trying to make sense of the numbers, trying to forecast, trying to understand what the numbers actually are telling you for the past and the future. So we use the numbers in order to understand what happens in the society. And when I say numbers, I mean the values that these variables are taking, like the prices, the inflation, the income, the, uh, the uh, employment level, all these uh, can be translated into numbers that econometrics uses in order to analyze what is happening in the economy. Now, the uh, distinction between uh, microeconomics and macroeconomics is a little uh, difficult. First, it's difficult because with my accent, uh, they sound the same. Microeconomics and macroeconomics, a lot of people, they say that it sounds the same to me. It sounds totally different uh, that I say it. But in general, uh, most of the times you will see it written or on the slide. I think you will not have a problem to understand what I'm talking about. So, uh, micro or micro uh, versus macroeconomics. Why economic units uh, and the economy as a whole are analyzed with different branches of economics? In other words, why do we need to have micro and macro? Why do we have two different versions? Like, for example, the unemployment in an industry, this is microeconomics. The um, the unemployment in the entire economy is macro variable. Why don't we just analyze the, both of them in the same way? Because if you think about it, what is the unemployment in the entire economy? Is there, let's say the sum of unemployment in every industry or the average actually of unemployment in every industry of the unemployment rate. So why don't we analyze it in the same way? There is a very important reason that we do that. And here's a question. So you see out there that there are uh, black cats, there are white cats, they are sometimes brown, they're sometimes gray, uh, and uh, dark gray, light gray. Some of them, they have different colors, but there are no transparent cats. Like, I mean, there are some cats that are transparent, but they are made of glass and they're totally decorative. They are not the, the real animal. And you would be like, what the heck is he talking about, about transparent cats? Give me a second. I can explain. So we know from uh, physics and from chemistry and from biology that all living organisms are made by cells, okay, by, by billions of cells. And then every cell is made by different molecules. Okay, it's a chain of molecules. And then every molecule we know from chemistry is made by atoms. And then again from chemistry, if I remember well, because it's a long time ago, uh, you have the protons, the neutrons, and the electrons that they make the, uh, every atom. So everything is made from electrons, protons, and neutrons. And actually, sciences now, they have decomposed even those to even smaller particles, but let's stay there. Now, if I remember correctly, the protons and the, uh, and the neutrons, they are in the nucleus of the atom. So they are like in the center, they just stay there. And then you have the electrons, you're, you're like, what? what course is that? Like, I thought that this was economics. Wait for it. Okay, so you have the, the nucleus, which is the neutrons, uh, the, the uh, neutrons and, the, and the protons there. 
And then you have the electrons that they go around like in, in, uh, uh, in, in, different, uh, in different ways from the, from, the, from the center, from the nucleus. And in general, atoms, if you, if you analyze them in a way of, of how chemistry does, they're just energy. So it's a very, very small, tiny thing which has very, very tiny things that they go around it in actually relatively far away distances. So if you have an atom and you actually, you actually magnify it a lot, most of it is what? Is, is, is empty. Okay, it's just things that they go around to something very small. Small things that they go around something very small. So if you look at it, like maybe they go around and you can see them, I, I doubt, but you can see on the other side. So since the cat is made of billions of those, I'm supposed to look at the cat and look on the other side. It will be totally transparent. But it's not. Why is that? The reason is the fallacy of composition. The fallacy of composition is the erroneous belief that what is true for the part is also true for the whole. And this is not the case sometimes. So let's see an economic example so we will be able to understand what is going on a little better because I suspect that because chemistry is not my field, perhaps this example didn't cut it that well. All right, so an economic example. Let's assume that, let's assume that um, after I film this lecture, I go home and I find an email that the president of the university invites me to her office tomorrow morning. So I wake up in the morning, I get dressed, I go to her office, and she tells me, Cosmas, I invited you here because I heard from the students that uh, you're filming these amazing lectures and uh, students like it very much, and they say that you are the best and other uh, amazing things like that. And therefore, I decided that I will give you a raise 50%. So I will rewrite your contract and you will be getting 50% higher salary. I will be amazed by that. This will be great news because now I will be able to have a higher salary. I will be richer. I will be able to buy much more things, like to afford much more things than I could afford before. This would be great news for me. That's amazing. But then when I'm planning to understand like how I'm going to spend the, uh, the newly earned money that I have, uh, I receive a phone call from, uh, from my friend uh, Giovanni and he tells me that, uh, Cosmas, guess what? I have amazing news. Uh, the president called me and she increased my salary 50% and also Nona's salary and also everybody else in the department. And then I open the news and I see on CNA that uh, everybody in Singapore got a 50% raise. Then that's not that great news for me anymore because if everybody has a 50% higher income, then this means that my 50% higher income will actually not give me such a higher purchasing power. Because if everybody has 50% more money to spend, this means that prices will start going up and they will catch up, so they will cancel out the purchasing power. So if I'm alone that I receive the raise, then this will have a, an effect on my purchasing power. If everybody else has that, the effect will be zero. So we see here that if I receive a higher salary while everyone else does not, I will enjoy higher purchasing power. If everybody receives a higher salary, of course, by the same proportion here, prices will increase, my purchasing power will remain constant as everybody else's. So you can see here that it's different if we do something to the unit and different if we do it to the total. That, that's a, a very different notion. And this is why cats are not transparent, just because what happens to one cell doesn't give the same properties to actually the whole thing, which is uh, the cat. All right, so similarity in variables, again, a usual point of confusion is whether a variable is uh, micro 
or macro, so it's difficult to distinguish them in the beginning. Uh, in the beginning, people have trouble doing that. I give them exercises and they, uh, they are confused a lot. But then as the course progresses, this is one of the misunderstandings that just goes away. Students uh, just try to, to get used to the course and they, they, it makes sense to them. So after some point, it never happened to me in the end that I will have a, in the final exam, I will have a question about the distinction of micro and macro and a serious amount of students will actually be able to confuse that. So, so this is something that you will actually train yourself by studying for the course, you will, it will become easier for you than it will seem to you right now. So let's uh, try to make it as clear as possible. In terms of production, if you are talking about the production of a firm or an industry, so a production of a firm can be the production, for example, of, uh, of Coca-Cola, how many uh, millions uh, of cans Coca-Cola produced this year. Uh, the production of the whole industry is uh, how many cans of of uh, beverages were produced in total in the country. So this is the entire industry. Both of them microside. What is microside is the total domestic production. The production of cola, plus the production of other beverages, plus the production of food, plus the production of cars, plus the production of vaccines for COVID-19, hopefully, so I can have you here. And all these things together, these are macro variables. With respect to prices now, price of various goods, this is a microeconomic variable, like for example, price of tuition at Singapore Management University is a microeconomic variable, it's microeconomics. Price of education in Singapore, then what kind of variable that is? Answer in three, two, one, Again, it's a microeconomics variable because it's the price of a single good of an industry. Okay, what is a macro variable? A macro variable is the price level of the economy. An index that actually describes prices of everything produced in the economy. We will talk about it in lecture eight, but for now, we have to understand that price of any good that is a good of a, of a vendor or a good of an industry, this will be microeconomics, average price level of the entire economy, then this would be a macroeconomic variable. In terms of employment, firms' decision to hire workers or the employment in an entire industry, this will be on the micro side and then on the macro side, we have the national unemployment level, the total amount of people that they are unemployed and they're willing to get a job at almost anything. Because look at that, if you are an unemployed, let's say, furniture ma maker, uh, you, you, you make uh, uh, chairs, for example, and then you are unemployed, then for the industry, you will be unemployed, but also for the economy, the economy can employ you in a different sector. If you, if you cannot find a, a job making chairs, you can actually find a job, let's say, driving a truck or something like that. So in the economy, there is a different way of substituting the production factors from one use to another than it is in an industry. And this is quite important. So uh, some other examples. Price of tuition at SMU. We already answered that right down in your notes. This is a microeconomic variable. National average prices for universities. This is written in a specific way to trick people. National average prices for universities. Okay, do not uh, take the bait here. This is again a micro variable because it's the average price for an industry, just a statistic. It's not the, the uh, price level in the economy, which is a macro variable. And finally, the general price level, the general price level in the economy, this is a macro variable. So be very careful if it has to do with only one vendor or one household or one industry, this is most likely microeconomics. If it has to do with the entire economy, 
at a national level, then this is on the micro side. All right, uh, let's talk a little bit about basic concepts and ideas in economics, which is much more fun than that. Okay, this was a little dull, and um, even, um, uh, even I got bored a little bit uh, between us. So let's get to the basic concepts and let's talk a little bit about the philosophy of, uh, of economics. And philosophy, sometimes it's a, it's a little boring, but not here. You will see that this is kind of interesting. It will teach you some interesting stuff. Let's get started. So basic concepts of economics. Let's start with the opportunity cost. I know that uh, the ones of you that you have been to uh, the junior college, for sure you have done, you have talked about opportunity cost. But here I want to reconsider it, first of all, because everybody has to understand it. And second, a lot of people that they are coming to me, a lot of students that they are coming to me from junior colleges, they do not have the, the true opinion, the true knowledge about uh, opportunity cost like they should. So let's try to put everything together here. Opportunity cost of a choice, so we have choices here. When you have a choice, it means that you have a menu of alternatives and you are going to pick one because you cannot pick all of them. All right. So for example, when they ask you, would you like pizza or pasta for dinner? They usually mean pick one. Don't be greedy and you want to have both. All right. So you have to make a choice, meaning that um, uh, you pick one. If you could pick everything, they would not ask you. you. You never go to a buffet restaurant and they have pizza and pasta and they ask you pizza or pasta. They don't ask you because you can have both of them. Okay, so when you have opportunity cost, it means that you have to make a choice. It means that you have several alternatives and it means that you cannot select all of them. You have to forego something. So the opportunity cost is the benefit that you lose, that you forego, from the next best alternative choice that you cannot take. All right, so you do one thing, it means that you don't do another one. The benefit that you would get from the other one that you don't get to do, then this is your opportunity cost. And this is super important. Usually, in many courses of economics, they talk about opportunity cost in the beginning, and then they forget about it. Not in this course, not at the university level. Opportunity cost is one of the core concepts of economics and we have to be able to understand it. So, my two most favorite things for my Sunday morning, either go for a run at the park, all right, that's the one, and the other one, go for a ride with my motorbike. So these are the two different things that I enjoy doing. Uh, of course, I have other choices also, but I do not even consider those because these are the, the two best choices I have. The others automatically become irrelevant. So, uh, which one should I select? The opportunity cost of running is the total pleasure I forgo from riding. So I have to be able to measure, first of all, the pleasure that I get from each thing. I have to be able to kind of quantify it so I can rank the alternative choices that I have. We will see today how this can be done, but for now, we have to understand that. The opportunity cost of running of the, of the one choice is the pleasure that you would get if you were doing the other thing and you don't do it because you do running. If you do one thing, and this thing that you do has higher opportunity cost than the thing that you don't do, it means that you are doing the wrong thing. Okay, it means that what you are not doing, if you were doing it, it would give you a lower opportunity cost, but you chose to do something that has a higher opportunity cost and uh, everything else equal, it means that if you have done that, uh, you, you were under the influence of something and, or you were not very smart. Okay, and because none of this should happen, we always have to understand that a rational human being will be able to pick the choice that gives a less opportunity cost than the choice that uh, is not taken. So uh, here's an interesting story. Once in Moscow, 
I met an Uber driver who was a PhD in sociology. This is a totally true story. And uh, here's what happened. I, uh, the, my, I lived in, uh, in Moscow, Russia for seven years. And this was from 2012 till uh, 2019, seven years. And uh, uh, Moscow is an amazing city with amazing history and culture and cold and um, uh, many, many other things. It's huge, it's 17 million population. And one of the best things that uh, happened for me in Moscow was that I could take a taxi and because my Russian was not very good because I'm not, I'm not from Russia. So uh, my Russian was not very good and I would take taxi and typically taxi drivers and everybody else, uh, they didn't speak very good English. They didn't speak good English. They, they didn't speak any English, most of the population. And um, uh, this is um, the best thing that you can enjoy, a quiet ride, because in the beginning, uh, every decent taxi driver will try to start a conversation with you. And um, uh, because sometimes you don't want that, this was the best thing for me, because I will tell them, Yani uh, Paruski, which means I don't understand Russian, which is pretty much 30% of the Russian that I can speak. And, um, uh, I would get out, the guy would be like, okay, this guy doesn't speak, uh, doesn't speak uh, any, any Russian, so why should I start the conversation? Uh, but not one day. One day I, I, I was not in the mood for any conversation. I was very nervous. I had to go to a, a very important meeting and I was uh, even wanted to use the time to prepare in taxi. So I get into the taxi and I, I sit in the back and we start the ride and the guy tries to start the conversation with me. And I tell him like, I don't understand Russian. And he's like, oh, do you speak English? And he even spoke like from what I heard, like better English even than me. And um, I was like, oh, okay, so you speak English? He's like, yeah, yeah, I speak English because I, um, I studied abroad and I went to university in England. I was like, oh, what did you study at the university? And uh, he told me that uh, I studied psychology. And I was like, oh, that's good. I, I, I like psychology very much. I'm an economist and sometimes I, I study psychology also. He's like, oh, you're an economist. What do you do? I'm a professor at university. Oh, you're a professor. It means that, are you a PhD? I'm, yeah, I am a, I'm a PhD. It's like, me too. It's like, you're a PhD? Yeah. In psychology? Yes. And my next question would be, if I wanted to be rude, if you're a PhD in psychology, why you drive an Uber? And the guy was like, um, uh, you know what? Salaries are so small for psychologists in Moscow that uh, I, I am much better off if I actually take a job as an Uber driver. And um, I asked a couple of psychologists that we had at the department, some behavioral psychologists that they were doing uh, marketing research and stuff like that. So they were relevant to an economics department. And they said, no, the salaries of psychologists, they are extremely low in Moscow because they, um, traditionally the Soviet regime that was before and even the, the Russian regime that was later, they didn't value very much psychology as a science. They didn't find any real use and they, they paid very little money for psychologists. And this was something that uh, impressed me, impressed me very much because you would never see something like that for a finance person. A finance person, uh, I had students that they were in the third year and they were working already at top banks and, and uh, credit institutions in Moscow. I had a student that was working for Goldman Sachs, another that was uh, working for a huge credit union, another one that was working for British American Tobacco, another one that was working at the at the, um, one of the big four companies. I had somebody who was in the uh, consulting department of Boston Consulting Group and several other like, like students that they were, you know, like, like they, they were just finishing their studies. They were towards finishing their studies and they had already jobs and they were making salaries. Why? Because this economy had given priority to finance and economics. That's what the people that they, they uh, the, the job market were looking and they didn't really care so much about social programs and everything else. So all sociologists, they would not get a decent salary if they were doing the science. 
And this is why you could not find an economist or a finance person in the specific economy to do something else other than their science because their science paid a lot. While if you, were want, if you wanted to, uh, to stick to so sociology, if you were studying sociology, you would have to, to take a lower wage. Why? Because your opportunity cost of being a sociologist was much higher than being an economist. Okay, so the, the economist will never want to take an Uber job because they would have alternatives that they pay better. What is that? That everything of this discussion boils down to how the opportunity cost affects our decisions. So let's take this and let's try to incorporate it to the notion of cost in general. So a basic difference between economics and accounting is how value is counted. So economists and accountants, they count value in a much different way. First of all, accountants do not deal with the opportunity cost at all. From the, from the side of the accounting, opportunity cost is irrelevant because opportunity cost is not actually paid to anybody. If I go for a ride and I don't go for running, I have an opportunity cost, but this doesn't mean that I will go and pay it to somebody. I incur that cost, but I do not indeed pay it to somebody else. There are no receipts or invoices, so it's not document it, you cannot document an opportunity cost, and then the accountant cannot measure it efficiently because the accountant can measure only things that they have accounts, that they are, they are uh, documented in some accounts in order to be measured. Economists, on the other hand, they must take into account the opportunity cost along with all other costs. So the economist will consider all documented costs, of course, but they will also consider additionally the opportunity cost because it does make a big difference. Opportunity cost is a cost. Is not, because it's a cost of opportunity, it doesn't mean that it's not a cost because it's not paid to anybody. It doesn't mean that this cost is not incurred. Economic decisions should always involve the opportunity cost. In general, decisions should always incur the opportunity cost or else those decisions they're not going to be right decisions. They will be very narrow-minded uh, decisions in case they do not involve the opportunity cost. Here is an example that I want to show you, and I want to pay attention. It's super easy, but it's also very easy to underestimate it and think that, oh yeah, this is a trivial example. It's not a trivial example at all. Uh, it's uh, Sophia's Freelance Enterprise. And the reason that I gave it this name is because I had, uh, uh, two semesters ago, I had this question as a homework, as, as a part of the homework. And students were uh, uh, very puzzled with this question. And I, and I didn't expect that it will be that a big deal. But uh, for several weeks later, students would, would come with questions about how did you get the solution? I cannot understand how you get the solution. So I decided to move this exercise, to move it into the lecture, so everybody will have a chance to understand it from the beginning. So it's easy, but it needs your attention. Okay, so let's start. Sophia makes and sells uh, bracelets. So um, things like that, they're handmade. So each one of them goes for $15 and you can do nothing for the price. You are a price taker. You are given a price from the market and this is the price that you have to sell uh, at. If you want to sell cheaper, uh, you just lose money because everybody else sells at uh, $15. If you sell for more money than that, nobody's gonna buy your bracelets because uh, it's supposed to, to the price to be 15 and they can find other equal uh, equal quality with yours, that they are 15, so they will not buy yours. So you can do nothing about the price. Uh, Sophia makes and sells bracelets for $15 each. Each day, Sophia can make up to 20 bracelets. Raw materials for each bracelet, the leather and the 
uh, all the stitches and everything that she uses for this glue and I don't know what else, they cost $8 per bracelet. So the question is how much money does Sophia make per day? And this is a very easy question. Is uh, The first question is very easy to understand. So let's try to see what is happening here. Revenue for Sophia is $15 per bracelet times 20 bracelets equals $300 per day. Uh, notice here that because Sophia can maintain a price of 15, and obviously she has a profit from each bracelet. She, has, she makes some money from each bracelet. It seems that uh, she will go and make 20 bracelets and not less. She doesn't want to decrease her revenue this way. And then the total cost for materials is $8 per bracelet times 20 bracelets. This will be $160 per day. So Sophia makes uh, 300, which is the revenue minus 160 which is the cost. Uh, this will give us a difference of 140, so she makes $140 per day. Now, a good question that we can ask is, what if Sophia could get another job and make $150 a day? I'm not saying that she quits bracelet making, that's a full-time job for her, but she has an offer of making $150 a day, and let's say she rejects this offer for unknown to us reasons. How can we use this information? Is it relevant? Or because she doesn't get the job, this information is not relevant at all? Let's see. I want to uh, be able to determine, to understand, to figure out how much is Sophia's profit. I calculated already how much money Sophia makes a day, how much is her income, but I want to calculate also her profit. And this may sound the same like the income, the amount of money that she takes home every day, but that's not it. That's not the right answer here. Let's see. An accountant would consider that the $140 per day that Sophia takes home is the profit of the enterprise. And the accountant from her side will be right because Sophia employs no workers. She has no other workers. $160 per day for raw materials is her only measurable cost. She doesn't have any other costs as far as the accountant and the uh, revenue service are concerned. And therefore, this sounds as if this is her profit. However, an economist would vertically disagree here. Her raw material cost is indeed $160 per day. Okay, there's no doubt about how much her documented cost is. But she also spends something else in production. She spends her time. She dedicates time. Now, Sophia doesn't have any other workers, but she employs herself. She works for her enterprise. She works for this little business that she has. And this resource of time, of labor, that, in other words, that she uses, maybe she doesn't pay it to anybody, but this doesn't mean that this resource doesn't have a cost. It does have a cost, which we can see that the market values this cost at $150 per day, because that's how, much, that's how much the market will pay here to leave that job and go do something else. So we can understand here that maybe Sophia doesn't take money out of her one pocket, pays herself and then puts it in another pocket, but this doesn't mean that the enterprise, as an enterprise, as an entity, doesn't face that cost. So the enterprise does face the cost of labor for Sophia, who is also the owner, but this doesn't really matter. So according to The Economist, Sophia's profit would be the revenue of 300 minus 160 for the raw materials cost per day, minus 150 for her time. So this makes her profit to be a loss. 
profit equals minus 10, meaning that loss of $10 per day. Now, she still makes and takes home $140 per day. The economist will not tell Sophia that you're going home with minus $10 and you have nothing to eat. Sophia does take home the $140 per day. So how is the economist explaining that? Very simple. 150 must count as compensation for her time or work. So 150 of this $140 is money that should count as labor income for Sophia. And then because, as you can see, 150 is larger than 140, her profit that she should write down in her economics analysis is minus 10 per day. So we see here that according to the accountant, she has profit of 140, but according to the economist, she has a profit of minus 10. What is the reason? That the accountant says, do you pay yourself? Do you officially have a salary? No, I don't. I just work. I enjoy my time here. I'm listening to my music. I make my little bracelets and then I'm selling them online. And that's I, what I do in, in, during the day. I don't really count my time and pay myself. All right. So even though you don't do that, it doesn't mean that you do not use this resource in the production of bracelets. And that's why we should include it. So who is right? Which one is the right approach? You will hear a lot of economists to say that, ah, accountants, they know nothing. Like accountants, they, they just count the, uh, the beans one by one and they, they can say that, uh, they, they can say how many they are and, and, and things like that. Uh, no, that's not, that's not true. Accounting has a very different purpose for economics. Accounting is a way to quantify different things. Quantify some things that, that the quantification is actually super useful for the company itself. The economist actually considers how decisions should be made. So here, if Sophia would like to pay taxes on something, I would say that my... If she says that my, um, uh, this, is an, this is my income from, from salary and then I have minus 10 as a, uh, as a profit, she will have problems with the IRS because the IRS will be like, ha, huh, that's suspicious. How did you decide that you should pay yourself like $150? $150? Do you have documentation for that? So Sophia actually can do that and can hire herself and can give a salary to herself. Of course, there are some conditions that they are totally outside of the scope of this course, but it can be done even in an accounting way. However, when you want to make a decision, you say, okay, should I take this job or should I, take, should I keep making bracelets? So in this case, if you judge only with respect to profit, so the only thing that Sophia cares about it's how much money she makes because some people, they do care about that. So they, they, you, you tell them, so do you, would you like to teach uh, in, the, uh, in the university and you will make X or you would like to go to the industry and become a consultant and you will get 3X. Some people, they say that, yes, I want to get uh, 3X because that's all I care for. Some other people, they judge also very different things into the decision and they do not make the decision solely on profit, okay? If though Sophia was from the first kind of people and she wanted to make a decision with respect to profit, she should consider the economics way of thinking, okay? Because the economics way of thinking tells her, do not be fooled by what, how much you make because you would make more if you actually worked in another job and you have a nine to five job instead of staying home and making bracelets every day. Okay, so the, the economics way of thinking has a different use than the accountant. The accountant measures things that the company needs to know as information of how they should proceed. On the other hand, the economics measures things in order to make decisions from one 
uh, to go on one way towards one way or go towards the other way. Another very interesting principle that we are going to find in this course is the ceteris paribus principle. Ceteris paribus is a Latin expression for everything else equal. If you noticed back in the video, I used this expression once before. So you have to have everything equal in order to be able to make comparisons. So you should every time change one thing if you want to understand what is the effect of your action in something. If you change one thing, but then other things also change together, you don't know if the difference that you will observe is because of this one thing that you changed or the other things that change together with it. Let's see how this works. Let's assume that we want to improve the performance of a car. This is a very um, uh, fun topic. There are some people that they are really into it. Like uh, when, I, when I was a teenager, I had some friends that they, uh, they would um, uh, go and buy like this uh, little cab motorbike and uh, they, would, they would pay like an X amount to buy that. And then they would pay five times X over the course of the next two, three years in order to modify it and make it like instead of going from 60 kilometers an hour, mine goes like 68 kilometers an hour now. That's, that was a big deal. Okay, so they would, uh, uh, modification is, uh, was a lot, of, a lot of fun. And uh, let's assume that you want to improve the performance of a car. So what can you do? All right, so one thing that you can do in order to improve the performance of a car is change the engine. The engine is what gives power to the car. A, a, a car that has, for example, an atmospheric uh, uh, motor, motor will, will get like some horsepower and a car that will have a turbocharged motor, it will run much faster with this kind of engine. So the first thing that you can change is the engine. The second thing that can improve the performance of a car a lot is the tires. The tires of the car will make the car to hold better when it turns, so it means that it can take the turns faster. So if you measure, for example, the performance in terms of lap time, then you will see that your lap time will go down as you uh, improve the, the tires also. And the third most important thing when you improve the car is stickers. Okay, stickers is uh, uh, very beneficial in, in making a fast cars because I have seen like the fastest cars in the world, like the fastest cars, uh, they are the ones that they have like a lot of stickers, like, like this one here. Okay, that this guy modified it the uh, the car, there is a saying that says each sticker gives you five uh, horsepower. So he has like at least 1,000 extra horsepower in this car. Uh, because I see, for example, the uh, Formula One cars, they have, what well, they have? Lots of stickers. Okay, one engine, four tires, hundreds of stickers. Okay, you should never underestimate the stickers for a car. And then we are going to change these three and we are going to understand the performance of the car by the time that it needs to complete a lap around the, uh, the track. Let's start with having an atmospheric engine. Uh, the tires that the car came with, 185 tires, and then has no stickers, that has like two stickers in the back, but you know, they are totally insignificant because they come from the company. These stickers do not, do not count. And then uh, we measure the average lap time after we make like, let's say 10 laps and the average lap time is 152 and 876 thousandths of a, of a second. Okay, I'm, I'm that precise in this example. All right, so this is um, the initial situation. And then we have to change things and then uh, uh, check our changes, our modifications, and compare them to the time that we record so we will know if it works or no. So the second, uh, the second observation is when you turbocharge the engine, you keep the same uh, tires and again you put no stickers. So with a turbo engine, only the turbo engine, the car uh, has a 20 second faster, almost 20 second faster uh, lap time. All right, so this is after 
just changing in the engine, and instead of an atmospheric, now you have a turbocharged engine. And then uh, in the third effort, you keep the turbo engine, and then you change the tires. You put like uh, racing tires, which are uh, thicker and also shorter, and has have like a bigger radius in this case. And you also put, since you're there, you put lots of stickers and you record a lap time which is another 10 seconds faster than before. So these are your observations. All right, this is what you have. So these three columns, the first three columns, they have to do with your changes. So these are your independent variables. They are independent because you control them. And this is the dependent variable because you don't control this. This depends on those. Okay, so you try to check how your independent variables affect the dependent variable. Now, this terminology, dependent, independent, it's not that important. If you don't, if you don't want, if you miss it, feel free. It will be something that if you do economics, you're going to uh, uh, find in next years something that uh, you will meet again and again. But in general, what, what, what the message is here is that these are the three things that you control, and this is the result of controlling those, and you want to use this as a proxy variable to measure performance because look at that, what you want to do is to improve the performance of a car. And here's the first question. Can you tell if the turbo mod improved the performance of the car? The answer is yes, I can. I can tell that it did improve it because I have changed the engine setteris paribus. I have changed the engine while I keep everything else constant. Okay, so if you keep everything else constant, then you can say that from the first to the second line, the only reason why the lap time was reduced by almost 20 seconds is because I have a better engine. So the effect of the engine was minus 20 seconds on the lap time, and this is something that is set to is paribus, because this didn't change, this didn't change either, only that change, and then this led to this difference that you have down there. So yes, you can answer this question, you have sufficient information to answer this question, and the answer is actually yes, it did improve it, and even more specifically, it improved it by dropping it from 152 to 132, improving the time by 20 seconds. Second question. Can you tell if the tires modification improved the performance? The answer is you cannot tell that. Because you change the tires, keeping the engine constant, you did change the tires, but you also put lots of stickers. Now, somebody can say, come on, Cosmas, everybody knows that stickers do not improve the performance. Uh, that's not always true, first of all. Like, there are some products, because they have a specific sticker on them, uh, they might cost 100 times more than another product. That's one thing. So stickers may be uh, making a difference. Nobody knows unless you test it. In science, we do not easily make decisions like that. Like, for example, if you are a, a true scientist, you speak only about the data. For example, you cannot go out and tell, uh, you know, um, a surgical mask is good enough to protect a totally immunocompromised person on the surgery table, but it's not good enough to protect somebody else from, your, uh, from you carrying the, a specific disease. Uh, if you are a true scientist, you have to speak with data. So you cannot say, oh, here I know the answer from the beginning. If you are testing, you should be testing seriously. So it doesn't matter if it's stickers. If you are testing, 
this table here is not able to confirm or reject that the 10 seconds are coming from the better tires or they are coming from the stickers. Now, we all have an intuition, but this doesn't mean that the science actually confirms our intuition. So if I go out, I will say, listen, my suspicion is that these 10 seconds came from the tires, not from the stickers. But I will not go out and say this is scientifically proven. Okay, so we have to be very careful here. So in order to understand if something affects something else, it should be the only one change. A variable must change ceteris paribus for calculating its effect on another variable. When we say ceteris paribus, we mean to be the only one that changes. So this is with respect to the ceteris paribus principle. Now, for this topic and any other topic that we talk about today, again, if you have any question, please write it down in the comments below of this video. So this will be great for you because you ask a question. Great for me because I have an opportunity to go and answer this question. And great for everybody else who can actually see your question, my answer or my TA's answer, and they can benefit from this uh, from this question. Also, if you think that you know the answer to somebody else's question, please go and give them an answer yourself. I don't mind if I see students disagreeing on what is the answer on something. Disagreement is what feeds science. Disagreement is a good thing when it happens in a scientific environment. If you have an opinion about somebody's question, you can go and answer this question. You are allowed to do that. Uh, I will also read the comments, your comments, and the question, of course, and everything else. And also, something else, because uh, we are doing science here, and we are all smart people, what we are trying to do, as every smart person does, before we ask a question, we take a look at the threads to see, is this question asked again? Because if somebody has asked the question like before, and then I go and I ask the same question again, this doesn't show the best picture for me, right? So please go ahead, check the, uh, the comments down below, and then go and add your question freely. Go answer questions of others, write comments, or everything that you need to share. And also, if you find a, a question that agrees with your question, go and like it. So I know that lots of people have this specific question, and then next time I will be a little more careful, or I will address it in the next live streaming, and I will know that a lot of people have this question. If a lot of people have a question, this gives me a very good signal that this is something that the problem is on my side. I didn't explain it very well, uh, not in the side of the students that they didn't understand it. All right, so uh, use the comments as, as best as you can. Now, the next uh, uh, thing that I want to talk to you about is the post hoc ergo propter hoc fallacy. Uh, people are like, they ask me usually the question, do we have to learn that? And my answer is that yes, not because it's necessary for economics, but because it's super cool to know that. Like imagine that you are out at a date and somebody tells you something like, yeah, you know what it is? This is the post hoc propter ergo hoc fallacy. And the other person could be like, oh, you know so much, that's so hot. Okay, so it's, it's super nice to know things. So this is very useful. So what is the post hoc propter ergo hoc fallacy? The post hoc ergo propter hoc fallacy is a logical fallacy. It's a Latin expression that means, after this, therefore, because of this. If something happens after something else, it means that it has been caused by this something else. All right, let's see this very specifically. Consider that event B that happens always before event C. So event B happens and then always C happens after B. Somebody can say that it's true 
that if event B happens always before C, then B causes C. And in most of the cases, this would be correct. This would be accurate, scientifically accurate. But the thing is that it doesn't have to be. It's not necessary that because something happens always before something else, then the first thing that occurs causes the second. And here is an example. Assume, for instance, that A causes both B and C. So you have here A, and then you have B, and then you have C. And you can consider that these three are kind on a timeline. Okay, so this is like a time zero, a time one, and a time two. So B always occurs before C, meaning that A causes B, B becomes very fast observable, but then it takes some more time for C to become observable. All right. Both of them have been caused by A. On top of that, A is never observable. So A exists, but you just cannot see it. Now, somebody who is not able to know all this information, what they will see, they will just see B and then C. And next time, B and then C. And then next time, B and then C. So they will be like, B causes C. But you, that you know exactly what happens on the other side of the curtain and how the trick is done, you know that this is not true. Sometimes, indeed, there is something that happens before something else and causes it. All right, so every time if I turn on the stove, the water will boil because I turn on the stove. If I do not turn on the stove, I, the water will not boil. So one causes the other. All right, but in some other cases, this doesn't happen. So the observer will see B and then C, B and then C, B and then C all the time, and falsely accept as true that B causes C, which is not the case. So here, we can say that B and C are correlated, they have a correlation relationship, but they do not have a causation relationship. So one doesn't cause the other, but the two are highly correlated. Now, the usual example for that is the rooster that cackles every morning, and then the day that actually comes, the sun that comes up. Uh, ancient uh, nations, they believed that if the rooster doesn't cackle, the, somewhere uh, the, the sun will not come up because of the post hoc propter ego hoc fallacy. But we know for a fact that this is not true uh, because now uh, uh, we have no roosters anymore in big cities, but still we can enjoy the, the day and the sun. So the thing is that there is like the planet that... Um, the planet that us, uh, everybody knows from science, uh, from scientific data and observations, we have the planet Earth that is uh, totally flat, and then the sun is uh, a sphere for some reason, and comes out, and then when the sun comes out, the rooster actually will be able to sense that from before and start cackling, and then because it has a biological clock inside, or I don't know, and then uh, the, the sun will actually be observed to come up. So we actually see one and then the other, but we know based on science that this, uh, this is not actually the case. In economics, this uh, can be very useful, and uh, we're not going to use this principle a lot, but I want you to know it, because in some cases we have uh, what we call the leading indicators variables. A leading indicator is a variable that actually uh, uh, shows something and then something else happens. Like, for example, we have uh, a very usual phenomenon that when construction is going bad, then the whole economy, the whole GDP goes down. Okay, and a lot of people believed that, uh, a lot of economists in the old times, they believed that construction leads the economy. If we should feed construction and keep construction alive all the time, so we will not have the economy to go under. But this is not the case. 
what you actually have is that what happens, a shock that happens in the economy, and you cannot really observe it, affects both what happens in construction and what happens on GDP, but the construction effect is visible much earlier than what happens to the whole GDP because of the measurement lag there. So what actually happens is that a lot of people thought that this is the case, that if construction goes bad, the economy goes bad, but actually that's not because of that. Because there were a lot of money put there, this will go up, but this will not go up that much, and this is because you didn't fix the cause, because this was not the cause. By putting money there, doesn't mean that you fix also this, which is not the same with that. Okay, so we see that this leading indicator is actually imply correlation of what happens to the construction industry with the entire economy, but one doesn't cause the other. And see, this is something important for you to know. There is an external video that I want you to watch. It's a brand new video. It was filmed in uh, 1978 in Pennsylvania. So this is a town hall meeting in which he gives a lecture and then he takes questions from people. So one of the members of the audience tries to pull, to pull a trick towards Milton Friedman. And once you know, like, there you got him, Milton Friedman actually spots the fallacy and gets out of the fallacy by explaining to everybody else. Try to watch the video and try to understand what the fallacy might be. Uh, totally optional if you want to uh, go and do it. Uh, be my guest, that would be a good training of what you learned today. Another very important notion that we use is the representative agent. So in an economy, no two economic actors are alike. The actions of billionaires and colossal corporations, they have much uh, different gravity than the actions of everyday people. Like I remember this case a couple of years ago, Jeff Bezos, uh, the owner of, of Amazon.com, recently went through a divorce. And usually divorces are topics that um, the tabloid uh, publications, they usually examine like the, the divorce of, um, of uh, Brad Pitt and uh, Jennifer Aniston and then with uh, Angelina Jolie that he was married to. It was a, it was a major topic in tabloid, but uh, the, uh, the divorce of uh, Jeff Bezos and his wife was one of the major topics in a Wall Street Journal and many other top publications regarding of the future of humanity because they said uh, Amazon is the biggest company in the world. Like if um, uh, the company goes to the hands of his wife who can be uh, a much better person than Jeff Bezos or a better entrepreneur than Jeff Bezos, but we just don't know that, then this means that there will be a huge company in the hands of somebody who is not trained or used to, or we don't know how they will, they will treat it. So they, people were concerned about, about his divorce. Now, uh, another friend of mine once got divorced, and the only thing that happened is that uh, uh, we were asking the, him why he's unshaved. Okay, so there's a total different gravity between the divorce of Jeff Bezos and, and uh, his divorce. But in general, uh, you see that no two actors are alike. Like there are different corporations, there are different individuals, uh, and there is different gravity in everybody's decisions. So in economics, we want to simplify this, the, this analysis, and we want to consider the representative agent. So we do, we, we, uh, we do a trick, a trick that works uh, very well. This was uh, devised by Robert Lucas, another uh, Nobel Prize winner economist. And uh, uh, Lucas talked about the representative agent in a macroeconomic uh, framework, but we uh, apply it now in, in every notion of economics because it makes the analysis much more tractable and simple with uh, the same, almost the same quality of results. So here's what, uh, what happens. You have like all these, um, uh, all these different actors in the economy. And uh, here some of uh, some others, some are bigger than others, but I want to signify that different actors have different importance in the economy. So what you can do is that you can take the average height 
the average importance of this and replace this difficult to track situation. Because imagine if you had one action that is taken by this guy and one action that is taken by this guy and one action that is taken by this guy, these three actions would be kind of different to, to, to trace what the result will be because they, are, they have different gravity, they have different importance in this model. So in order to avoid the situation, what we do is that we replace the situation with an economy that also has six people that they're all equal to average. Okay, so we just take them and they, we consider that we always have to deal with the average. So now, if I take the decision of this guy or the decision of that guy, actually, they will be the same. So this makes my model much easier to be, uh, to be um, traced to what is going to happen in the end. So we analyze the decision of the average person. We call this person the representative agent. And we generalize the decisions and the choices of the representative agent to the entirety of the population. And this is something that doesn't give us as good results as if you take the exact people, but it's much, much easier to follow and do the calculations in these kinds of models and makes our life much easier. So in our questions, in our tasks, in our problems, usually we have economies that they have similar households, similar firms. All firms are the same. All households are the same. One is a copy of another, so everybody is a copy of the average. This doesn't mean that these models do not apply in real economies. They can be extrapolated to real economies, but what we consider is making the analysis a little simpler to follow without loss of generality. This approach, however, can be used only when the actual dissimilarity of actors does not really affect the analysis. And there are many ways to explain that. But for example, imagine that I want to make a decision with respect to, uh, uh, for example, let's say that my male students have, uh, different, uh, have different needs than my female students. All right, uh, I had this case when I was in, uh, in Russia, I was teaching in Russia, because in Russia, the male students, the one day of, in the week, they had to uh, go to the army, to have army service, and uh, the girls didn't have this, uh, this kind of, of thing. So I had to make some decisions with respect to the whole class. In this case, I cannot really, uh, I cannot really, uh, uh, consider the average student between, what is the average between a male and a female? This, this thing doesn't really exist. Like, okay, the average is something that you can take with respect to numbers. I can average your height. I can average your, uh, your income. I can average a lot of other things. I cannot average your gender because your gender is something that doesn't, doesn't really average. Okay, if, if, you, if you average it, maybe you will take, first of all, if, if you find a way to average it and you agree that we are going to average like that, then what you will take will not have the, any of the properties of the, of the two sides. Okay, it's not going to be represented in the class or at least it's not going to be represented as much as everybody else in the class. If you go to my previous example here, you will see that, he, look at that, my average here is actually the most prominent specimen here in my sample. Okay, these two guys are equal to the average. Okay, and this is, a, this is a good choice. It's not like if I had an economy that had only tall people on that side and only short people on that side and I average it here, this, is, this was not gonna work as good as now that you have already two that they are the average and the others are close to the average and they can be averaged. I hope you understood this. If you didn't understand, uh, be my guest, write down questions in the comments, and I will definitely try to, to do a better job on this. All right, so uh, let's talk a little bit about utility. One of the basic needs of the economic science is to rank alternative choices, because we said that we want to examine how we make decisions. This means that we have alternative choices, and we have to find a way to evaluate these alternative choices. 
Therefore, we must be able to quantify it somehow. We have to find units of uh, utility, assign units of utility to various alternative choices. So the more units of utility that an alternative has, it means the more preferable it is for me. Assigning utility is the way of economics to deal with preference. How economists try to quantify utility or pleasure or satisfaction or happiness from the use of anything. Any product that you use serves a need or just gives you plain satisfaction and we try to quantify this. The only purpose, however, of this quantification is ranking. I do not care so much about the absolute numbers that I have as much as I care for the order that these numbers give me. So I'm trying to rank different alternatives in an order of preference. So assume that I want to rank my preferences for tonight for dinner. And I have, let's say, three choices. I have the choice of Indian, I have the choice of American, that's burgers, and I have a choice of Italian, let's say pizza. All right, and I can tell you that my preference is Indian 54, burger 44, and pizza 34. If I give you this, the first thing you will do is ask me, what do you mean 54? Like, what is, what is 54? And my answer would be, why do you care? The only thing that you should care is that this shows you that I prefer Indian over burgers, burgers over pizza, and Indian over pizza. This is a perfect ranking. This can actually show you that this is my first preference, my second preference, and my third preference. I could not give you that. I could give you another ranking. I could tell you that Indian gets 3,458,651 and units of utility, burger 0 0.3, and pizza 0 0.0001. This would serve exactly the same purpose like the first one. Again, it ranks Indian first, burger second, pizza third. Again, in the same way. But you will be like, oh yeah, but now the difference between these two is much bigger than this one. No, we do not care about the difference. The difference uh, actually doesn't really make, uh, make sense here. You are used to this kind of measurement. Like, for example, the measurement of temperature is exactly that. When the temperature is 20 degrees, it doesn't mean that it's half as hot as if it is 40 degrees. If it's one degree and then the, the temperature next day becomes two degrees, it doesn't mean that the next day it's going to have double the heat. Okay, if... Also, I give you this, Indian, zero units of utility, burger, minus one unit of utility, and pizza, minus three units of utility. Again, you can figure out that I prefer Indian first, burger second, and pizza third. But you will be like, wait, Indian gives you no utility, and then burger and pizza gives you disutility. Why should that be? If you have zero temperature, it means the absence of temperature. No, it doesn't. Zero temperature for somebody in Singapore is something like minus 32 from somebody in the United States. Sorry, 32 for some, in the United States, they don't even know how to measure temperature. Okay, so the, the, the number that you assign is zero, the number that the Americans assign is 32, and it has the same meaning as where the water freezes. 32 Fahrenheit or zero Celsius. Same thing here. Indian gives me zero units, which is much better than minus one and minus three. And the, 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 ones, the fact that this has minus doesn't mean that I dislike them. 
It means that I rank them in such a way that I show you that this is my best, this is my second best, and this is my third best. So utility is an arbitrary measurement that actually shows what is my order of preference, how I express my preferences, what is better for me, what is worse for me, and then the number, the actual number that it takes, it makes sense only when you compare it to something else, its magnitude, it doesn't matter that much. What matters is which one is the biggest, which one is the medium, and which one is the smallest. That's how we use utility and how we're going to use it in this course. It's very useful, and we will use it a lot, to be able to distinguish between average and marginal values. In economics, we often deal with series of numbers. Series of numbers are numbers, are variables, that they are in a particular order. So for example, if I give you cost information, I'm going to give you the cost of the first unit, the cost of the second unit, the cost if you produce three units, if you produce four, five, six, up to, let's say, 100. These numbers, they make sense in a series. You cannot consider the number, of, uh, the cost of 10 units and then jump to the cost of 15, and then jump to the cost of six, and then go back to the cost of 11. So they make sense when they are in a series, from, from one unit up to 100 units. All right, so you have a series of numbers that you deal with, like for example, production in units by workers. So this much production by one worker, this much production by the second worker, this much production by the third worker. You put the workers in order, and therefore the production of every worker will be in order. Cost in dollars from producing certain units, what we said before. Revenue in dollars by selling those units. So by selling the first unit, you have that revenue, the second unit, that revenue, the third, uh, the third unit, another revenue, etc., etc. Again, you have a series. Utility or satisfaction from consuming units can also be a series. You can have 10 units of utility from consuming one uh, uh, slice of cheesecake, then you can have 15 units of utility from consuming two slices of cheesecake, 17 units of utility from consuming three slices of cheesecake, etc. Uh, we put those again in an order. So once you have these values in an order, you can take an average value. This would be the total divided by the number of units. Like for example, you can consider the average cost, the average height, the average temperature, your average exam scores. These are very easy for you to understand because you use this kind of variables very often. And then you have the marginal value of something. The marginal value is how much the last unit that you consider, this given unit that you consider added in comparison to the previous unit. So the marginal cost of the 10th unit, for example, in how much the 10th unit affected the total cost. Okay, what is the change that the 10th unit caused to the total cost? The marginal cost of the 11th unit is how much the 11th unit affected the total cost. So marginal cost of the 10th unit is how much total cost was affected by the 10th unit, Marginal utility of my third slice of cake is the units of pleasure that the third slice gives me. Total utility from eating three slices minus the total utility from eating two slices. If I have the total utility from three slices, this is for all three slices. If I have the total utility of two slices, I can subtract the three from the two, the, the total utility from three units and the total utility for two units, I can subtract the two, and I will have the marginal utility that I receive from the third unit of cake that I consume. These are all very useful, and we should know it, we should be able to understand, because we will use them and we will have many examples. This will be one of your, one question of your homework, and I think it will be quite easy. Once you, you see this segment, I think it will be very easy to go and solve these questions and you will have no problems. But if you have, again, down in the comments, ask questions and we will try our best 
to try to uh, to try to do it. Now, do not ask any question from the homework down in the comments, and somebody else go and and answer that. Right? I, I think that's easy to understand. All right. So, uh, this is with respect to basic concepts, and then we have graphs and equations. Graphs and equations is something that most of you you will find uh, uh, already that all you already know it, and it's very easy. Actually, all of you you already know it. Uh, the problem is that some of you, you just, uh, you just think that you don't know it. You think that math is like a, um, a monster, that um, every time that, uh, that you come along, it's, it's actually, it's going to cause you to not understand, it's going to make it difficult for you and everything. But math is just a tool, and uh, sometimes it's useful. And you will see that in this course, math is not going to be hard to use. And it happened to a lot of students. I had a lot of students in, in my career that even in, uh, after the semester has progressed a lot, they still avoid to come to contact with the math of the course. And uh, some of them, they never do. And that's a very big mistake uh, because they, they could understand things much easier and get much higher scores if they have, have made a reasonable effort. And if there is a, a large amount of students that they, they, they fear math, and then in the end, they understand that their fear is just unjustified because the math is so easy to follow. Actually, uh, one day I'm going to do that. I'm going to find a, a right candidate, a 12-year-old uh, student, and I will teach this person like all the math that, that need to know for this. And you will see that uh, this person will just be able to... to solve the math like that, because these math are very easy. So, I have a tutorial video, the internal video, will take you through graphs and equations at the level that we, we will need them in this course. If you have some technical background, you will find this video really easy. Still, follow it, it's not very long, it's just uh, uh, 12 minutes and 49 seconds voiceover. It has some animations, I think that it will be relatively easy to follow and it will not be a big problem. So this is all I had to say for today. Uh, I, I blathered a lot, so probably this lecture has gone a little bit over than what I intended. Still, you can, uh, I hope at least since you made it uh, here that uh, you didn't find it boring. If you did, again, you know the, the speed uh, button that you can actually increase the speed and can avoid all this. But in general, this is the level of the difficulty that we are going to go with. Some of the things will be a little more technical, but always I will be able to raise a flag every time that something is difficult and you will be able to understand it. In general, again, this is not a very difficult course and it will become more and more interesting. So, I will see you in the live streaming and next week for lecture two. Have a good one.